House of the Dragon just continues getting better and better each week. I'm blown away, honestly, uh, by this this seventh episode uh, titled Driftmark. Um, we see we open at the funeral of Lena uh, Valerian, and lots of important people have come to Driftmark to send her off. Uh, the Valerians bury their their noble dead at sea, unlike the Targaryens who burn them up with dragonfire. Um, so the king, the queen, the new returning hand of the king, uh, Otto Hightower, and numerous other dignitaries have shown up, including Rhaenyra, uh, Lena's brother, Lenor, obviously Lord Corlys and Rhaenys, the father and mother, uh, all the children. Uh, it's, it's a big old gathering of, you know, close family and uh, important people. Uh, Laris Strong is there, the new Lord of Harrenhal, after murdering his father and brother. Uh, so it opens to this this funeral scene, which is quite lovely, and the music that's playing over it is haunting and beautiful. And I am immediately just, even, even though very little is happening, you know, there it's just gripping. It's it's a it's a it's beautifully shot. It's beautifully. Uh, somber and and then and then there's little punctuation marks of 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 tension or or even humor in a way at one point uh Damon Targaryen giggles while his now dead wife's uncle is reading or is is speaking the ceremony words and it mentions that their blood needs to remain pure he giggles and this idea of pure blood comes up more than once later there's a conversation between Corlys and Rhaenys about how obviously Rhaenyra's kids are not, uh, you know, Lenors, which also comes up multiple times. And he says, and I liked this, he said, legacy isn't built on, on blood. People don't remember blood. People remember names, which is an interesting observation because this, this idea of bloodlines and of passing on legacy is so important to everyone. But Corliss doesn't care that those kids aren't his blood. They're his, they're still his legacy. They're still his, you know, his house's future. And uh, after this very sort of tense um, wake, the, you know, after the funeral, everyone's sort of milling about. There's people are drinking wine. There's many long and meaningful looks. You can tell that, you know, King uh, Viserys wants to talk with Damon. Eventually he finally gets over there. You can see where Nero wants to t talk with Damon. And eventually they go on a walk together on the beach. A lot of the children are sent to bed. The king goes to bed. Rhaenyra and Damon go out on the beach and they talk. And she talks about how he abandoned her. And he says he spared her. And then they eventually start making out. And then they have sex down there on the beach. And, uh, you know, finally sort of 10 years later after that weird incident in Flea Bottom in the, in the pleasure house, they finally consummate this strange incestuous romance. It's... It's a beautiful, it's honestly, it's a beautiful scene. I, it's interesting to compare this, this relationship with Cersei and Jaime, because in some ways, Cersei and Jaime have a bit more of a mustache twirling villain vibe about them, especially early on, you know, when he pushes, I'm not, I'm not saying that there's, it's a bad relationship, but they're so much more clearly bad characters than, than these two. These two are Rhaenyra and Damon are super complicated. And that's one thing I'm noticing about this show is I feel like even though we don't have as much to root for, like nobody's quite as root forable as, you know, Arya or Tyrion or whatever. They're all very complex and fascinating characters. And I just want to know more about all of them. And the show is, in a way, it's a little more grown up than Game of Thrones. It's a little bit less epic fantasy and a little bit more serious succession drama. And I know people have described it as a soap opera and there's that too. It's a very serious one. Uh, the other character who doesn't go to bed is Aemond, uh, the second son of Alicent and Viserys. And he goes after what he, what sounds like dragon wings, eventually coming to the slumbering form of Vagar, the, the dragon who belonged previously to Lena, Lena uh, Valarian, but is an ancient dragon who actually was one of the three dragons that Aegon the Conqueror rode in on, that his, um, his sister wife Visenya actually rode this dragon. And it's the largest dragon in the world now. Uh, it's grown as big as Balerion the Black Dread, who, who's now has passed away. So it's now the largest, like most ancient dragon in the world that we know about. 
And Aemond ends up taming it, essentially, or bonding with it, however they do that. So now he is riding on Lena's form, former dragon and, and has brought basically the biggest dragon in the world into Alicent's camp, into the green camp, uh, which is bad news for Rhaenyra and her side. Uh, good news for Aemond, who's been picked on and bullied. But Aemond is also kind of a brutal, creepy little shit. And when he gets back to the castle at Driftmark, the, the daughters of Daemon and Lena are really upset because they thought that they would be take, you know, claiming the dragon. Aemon's like, well, you should have claimed it then. Tough luck. And he calls the boys, uh, Jace and Luke, bastards, and then a big fight ensues. And all the kids are pummeling him at one point, but he's bigger and stronger than them and gets away and gets a big rock. And it, it looks like he's going to smash the, uh, one of the boys' heads in, Jace's head in at one point. And the younger boy, Luke jumps up with a knife and cuts him in the eye. I don't think he means to cut him in the eye specifically, but that's what happens. It's kind of like he's trying to save his brother, right? And um, Amy at this point has punched girls in the face. Like he's, he just does not give a shit. Uh, so his eye gets cut and then the King's Guard rushes in and then they're all in the throne room and uh, it comes to light that he called them a bastard. And so Viserys is trying to question like, who told you this? Who told you this? And he says Aegon, and then Aegon is like, dude, we all can see. Like, it's we, we just know because look at them. And so this is a very, very awkward moment. And then Allison makes it worse because she says, you know, when Viserys says, okay, everybody say sorry and make nice, we're a family. Allison's like, no, I want his eye. I want Luke's eye to make up for the debt, to pay the debt. She tells uh, Sir Kristen Cole to go cut it out. And he's like, uh, I'm sworn to protect you, lady. I'm <laughs> cutting a kid's eye out. Um, so she grabs a dagger and she rushes Rhaenyra and it's the cat's paw dagger. It's the Valyrian steel dagger that we've seen multiple times in this show and in Game of Thrones. And they sort of grapple and Rhaenyra's like, hey, now everyone can see your true colors. Like you've been pretending this whole time, but now they can see what a vicious bitch you are. Allison cuts her, realizes what she's done, drops the knife, is mortified, freaks out. But later her father, uh, Otto Hightower, is like... I see that you have what it takes now to play the Game of Thrones. Like you, I never saw it before, but now I see. Of course, I don't think he realizes what she's done with, with Laris, you know. You know, what Laris has done for her in, in taking out Harwin and whatnot. And of course, then later Laris offers to get the eye as well. And she's like, no, 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 I don't, I don't need that. But she keeps Laris in her back pocket. She keeps him around. So, um... The other big thing to happen, I mean, other than Viserys being clearly extremely distraught by all this, he's looking like really death's door at this point. Like, can he even make the journey back to King's Landing? Um, other than that, uh, Lenor comes and basically tells Rhaenyra that he's willing to be more a more present husband and father. He has been not that. He's been kind of out gallivanting and, you know, carousing and having sex with his boyfriends and drinking and all that stuff and hasn't been really a part of the family. But then she meets with Damon later and she's like, I think we should get married. And so they plot to kill Lenor, but not really. They pl I, Okay, so it's left up to interpretation. Lenor is... They, they, Damon goes and gets Lenor's f lover and hires him to kill him, Lenor. But then Damon also kills this servant that they use to fake Lenor's death. So I think that Rhaenyra and Daemon plotted this all out, like giving Lenor and his lover a chance to, to take the money and run, get out of politics, get out of Westeros, go somewhere where they're more accepted, where they don't have to worry about king kingmaking and, and all this bullshit that they have to deal with here. And and basically they probably said like, you have to do this, this is this. <laughs> Like, you need to leave. Uh, I don't know. They didn't show any of that. But in the end, we see, you know, the fa the body of Lenor, presumably, and his parents are very upset because they just lost the daughter. Then we see Lenor and his lover uh, paddling out to sea and, in a, you know, absconding. I personally think that, um, that this was a plan that everybody agreed to. I don't think that this was done like behind Rhaenyra's back. I don't think she's vicious enough 
to actually kill her husband, who she clearly admires and has affection for and loves. Uh, maybe not romantically, obviously, because they don't swing for the same team and all that. But clearly, I, I mean, she cares for him and it would be ruthless as fuck to, to actually take him out. So uh, the one complaint I've heard about this episode is that it was too dark, too dim, too hard to see. I think that just depends on your screen. I thought it was up, it was quite dim, but not, not hard to make things out. I think they shot a lot of this at twilight with natural light, which of course is going to make things harder to see. And I can see why if you aren't be able to make out the characters in these scenes, that that would be frustrating. And hopefully they avoid that in the future. But I actually thought it was hauntingly beautiful the way this, this, this episode was shot and the vagueness and ethereal nature of, of these scenes it at twilight almost dreamlike especially with that music my god uh the same composer as westworld and game of thrones composes this uh, i'm gonna butcher his name if i say it off the top of my head but i think this this episode may have been his finest work I and mean, it's just gorgeous throughout and and i think this is probably my favorite episode of the season and i think it's really fine not only finding its feet but in some ways it is eclipsing game of thrones for me in terms of just like the the depth of character development and plotting and um you know even though I, there's not as many people to root for, for yet although i i do really like rhaenyra and her kids and and damon's kids and damon i i just think it's it's a very mature fantasy uh succession fantasy and i just i love it i i honestly I've, I've enjoyed each episode more the second time I've seen it. This is the first time I've seen this one, but I want to watch it again uh, as soon as possible because I just thought it was brilliant. So let me know what you think uh, or what you thought of the episode if you've watched it already down in the comments. Be sure to like, subscribe, all that jazz. And thanks for watching. Peace.